I asked you to name your 10 United strikers of all time and didn't mention this player, I'd be quite disappointed, but it'd be understandable. He was a player who slips under the radar far too many times when it comes to United legends or the club's greatest ever goal scorers, in an area where the term legend is bandied around far too often. This Mancunian still has one of the best goal to game ratios of anyone that's ever pulled on that famous red shirt, and even holds club records that still stand today, despite the efforts of Law, Cole, Van Nistelrooy and Rashford. He survived Munich and had the scars to prove it, but remarkably still left Old Trafford when he was in his prime. It's your duty as a United fan to learn more about this legend, an original Busby babe, Dennis Violet. Dennis Sidney Violet was born in Mossside, Manchester on the 20th of September 1933, the youngest of three children. He played in the streets in the shadow of Main Road and grew up as a City supporter, but that hardly matters, because once he popped that United red, it changed him forever. Signing on at 15, Dennis had been discovered by Chief Scout Joe Armstrong and United assistant manager Jimmy Murphy. It was Jimmy who Dennis would credit for being the man who turned him into the player he was, but his goal-scoring talents were already prodigious. Violet joined the youth setup in 1949, turning professional the following year. Still, it took young Dennis more than three years until Matt Busby handed him his debut at the age of 19 on the 11th of April 1953 against one of United's arch-rivals at the time, Newcastle United. In the following season, Violet won a regular place in the United attack, settling in at inside left. In his first two and a bit seasons at the club, he'd already scored 32 goals in 70 appearances, but soon he'd be ratcheting that up as he forged a formidable striking partnership with Tommy Taylor. Dennis's physique was not typically a footballer's one. He was thin and wiry and you'd wonder how he'd mix it up with the physical nature of 1950s football with its strapping defenders. However, that side of the game, Dennis would leave to Taylor. The Yorkshireman being potent with his head and strong in the air. And Dennis, silky, sharp and stealthy on the floor, was lightning quick. Violet had a sharp football brain with a vision to be able to think two moves ahead of the opposition, coupled with instinctive ball control and unparalleled acceleration. Along with great movement and the ability of being a ruthless finisher, Dennis would often pass the ball into the net without having to belt it like Bobby. Over the next four and a half years, the goals flowed as Violet and Taylor had an almost telepathic understanding and scored well over 200 goals between them in that time. Dennis helped take United to the 55-56 League Championship by a massive 11 points from Blackpool and Wolves, with him and Tommy bagging 56 goals together. The first game of the 56-57 campaign was the Charity Shield, and it was a Manchester derby. The Red Devils won 1-0 thanks to a 75-minute strike from Violet. However, that was just a mere distraction as it would be in this campaign that United would start their quest for European glory, defying the English FA and Football League to compete in the European Cup. In the preliminary round, the Red Devils played Belgian champions Anderlecht, beating them 2-0 away thanks to Taylor and Violet, and then 10-0 at home, which is still a club record with Dennis hitting four of them, the fourth of what would be nine hat-tricks in United colours. The boys made it all the way to the semis that season against the legendary Real Madrid side of the era, but their naivety showed as they succumbed 3-1 to Madrid in front of 135,000 fans and then could only draw 2-2 at home, going out on aggregate. Dennis, however, was top scorer with nine goals in the competition. Tommy just won behind him. Disappointed but not undaunted, United retained the first division title, this time by eight points from Spurs, and they also made the cup final against Villa, which set up the chance to be the first side in the 20th century to complete the elusive double. In what was a very physical era where keepers could be legally barged, Villa striker Peter McParland's clash with United keeper Ray Wood looked more than a tad cynical and broke the United player's cheekbone, knocking him out and putting him out of action for the rest of the game. As there were no subs, United were down to 10 men for at least 85 minutes, and so Jackie Blanchflower deputised. United conceded two second half goals to McParland, and despite consolation late on with a header from Taylor, Dennis and United had been cruelly denied. United would get some sort of recompense in the following season's charity shield, beating Villa 4-0 at Wembley, with Tommy Taylor getting a hat-trick. As champions from the season before, United had another shot at Europe, and whilst they were battling in third place, six points behind leaders Wolves in the title race, on the 5th of February 1958, Dennis hit the first goal in Belgrade as United claimed a 3-3 draw against Red Star, winning through on aggregate and setting up a semi-final against AC Milan. The next day, the 6th, stopping to refuel in Munich in terrible snowy conditions, the captain of British Airways Flight 609 tried for a third time to take off, but some slush on the runway led the plane to skid and crashed through a fence and into a house at the end of the runway. Seven of Dennis's teammates died instantly, Captain Roger Byrne. Mark Jones, Eddie Coleman, Jeff Bent, Liam Whelan, 
and David Pegg. Dennis, who was sitting next to Bobby Charlton, were both thrown clear. Dennis suffered facial injuries and a severe gash to his head. Duncan Edwards, built like a tank, earning him that name, would die 15 days later. With winger Johnny Berry and halfback Jackie Blanchflower never being able to play again. The crash, apart from the physical injuries, left its emotional scars too. Interviewed in 2019, Dennis's daughter Rachel, who directed and produced a documentary film on her father's life, released in 2016 called A United Man, which we'll have a link in the description, said this. It's had a huge impact on his life. He couldn't sleep at night and suffered from survivor's guilt. The tragedy stayed with him his entire life. As he couldn't sleep, he kept going out a lot, going out on the town. But certainly after Munich, he valued life even more. Lived it to the fullest and those memories certainly stayed with him. He spoke so fondly of those years with the Busby Babes under Sir Matt. Dennis didn't play for most of the rest of the season and the Football League had little compassion for Busby or his team, who had ignored their instructions and broken their arrogant embargo of UEFA competitions. The domestic season wasn't extended for United to play their fixtures, and this makeshift side was back in cup action just 13 days later against Sheffield Wednesday, and in league action just three days after that. The 1957-58 side dropped from 3rd to finish undeservedly in ninth. However, somehow United managed to make that year's cup final, but Dennis was unable to help on the road to Wembley, as he'd still not recovered from his injuries. Miraculously, the Mancunian was declared fit for the final itself against Bolton on the 3rd of May. Survivors Harry Gregg, now captain Bill Folks and Bobby Charlton, were all that were left of that glorious side to take on the line of the end and Matt Lofthouse and co. It was Lofthouse who did for the boys that day, barging Harry Gregg legally into the goal, but having the same effect as McParlin's seemingly more targeted challenge on Wood in the previous year's corresponding game. Gregg couldn't continue and United were down to 10 men again. There would be no fairy tale. Bolton won the Cup 2-0 that day and it would be their last FA Cup, as it was Villa's to this very day. It was UEFA who would have more sympathy than the Football League or FA as they allowed United to play their European Cup semi-final against Milan in May after the Cup final. United won the first leg with goals from Violet and Taylor, but it'd be Ernie and not Tommy this time around. However, in the return leg in Milan, understandably United folded 4-0 and went out at that stage. In the league itself, with Tommy gone, Dennis moved to the centre forward berth and put away 21 goals. Along with Bobby Charlton's 29 strikes, United defied the odds and doubters by finishing runners up to Wolves in the 58-59 campaign. The following season, now captaining United, Dennis made some United history that still stands to this day and wasn't able to be surpassed by the Holy Trinity, Rude, Ronaldo or Rooney. Dennis Violet scored 32 goals in 36 league games that campaign, despite missing half a dozen matches through injury at the back end of the season. That record is now 61 years old. United chalked up 102 goals in that 1959-60 season, but 16 defeats meant that they only recorded a top half finish. It was clear that the team hadn't fully recovered from Munich and actually started to struggle. Despite that club record goal haul and another 23 goals in the next season and a half, Busby felt that a change was needed to improve the club's league form. Maybe it was Dennis not being able to settle his mind in his personal life after the tragedy. Perhaps it was salary disagreements. But to the shock of the Stratford end, he was ignominiously sold to second division Stoke City for a bargain fee of £25,000. This seemed like a shoddy way to treat a player who'd won two league titles, a couple of charity shields, broke club scoring records, was the third highest ever scorer when he left, and even today is still in fifth place. With a goals to game ratio of United's top 100 scorers, which is only bettered by Ruud van Nistelrooy and Tommy Taylor. Also since Munich, he'd been rewarded with a paltry pair of England caps, scoring his sole goal for his country against Luxembourg. Yet another injustice. So, at 28 years of age, Dennis Violet was still in his prime and the Potter's boss, Tony Waddington, would be rewarded for building a side with experience. Not only was Dennis Violet there, but also Stanley Matthews and a slew of other veterans. In Dennis's first full year in the Potteries, his 23 goals helped his side gain promotion in the 1962-63 season. The season after that, Stoke lost a two-legged League Cup final against Leicester City. After spending five years at Stoke, scoring 66 goals in 207 games, he retired aged 34. However, that decision seemed to be ill-conceived and was short-lived. After Dennis decided that his future lay in America and he came out of retirement to join North American Soccer League side, the Baltimore Bays, Violet came home after two years stateside, joining non-league Witten Albion and then finished up playing and managing Linfield, winning the 1970 Irish FA Cup. At the end of that season, aged 36, Dennis finally hung up his boots but he wasn't finished with the game he loved. He returned to the States in 1974, becoming head coach of the unimaginatively named Washington Diplomats. 
In the 1980s, picking up an American Soccer League title along the way, Dennis coached at various levels in his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, and opened up soccer schools too, and stayed there for the rest of his life, promoting the game he loved over there. In 1997, Dennis, along with other Munich survivors, were graciously invited by UEFA to attend that year's Champions League final in Munich between Dortmund and Juventus. That poignant reunion was followed by the terrible news that Dennis fell ill soon after the event and was diagnosed with a brain tumour. Despite two years of treatment, Dennis Violet succumbed to the cancer on the 3rd of March 1999 at just 65 years of age and two months before the club where he became a legend won the treble. His ashes were scattered in the goldmouth of the Stratford End where they belonged. So what are your memories of Dennis Violet and what do you think of this arguably most overlooked and underrated of club legends? Please comment below, like, share and subscribe. Thank you once again for your support.